Good morning, Kara City. How you guys doing? Good. That's good. It has been a while since I've been up here to preach, and I think that's because Chris and Nathan are a little scared. I may do better than them. That's okay. Another thing I want to say is I'm the first that gets to preach on this Jumbotron. That's awesome. Look at that. Yeah, let's clap for that. That is awesome. And before I get into this this story and what God has on my heart for you guys this morning, I just wanted to give a little background. About a year and a half ago, I was in a unique position of what I was going to do for my career, my starting job, what I was going to do. I had just graduated from college, and I, had a, I was set on going to this really, really big, large church. It was, it was all my friends were going to be there. I was going to be a youth intern, intern. It was set. It was going to be awesome. But I had just heard about this small, planted church that needed a worship pastor, too. And during this time, I knew God was calling me to be a youth pastor, but at the same time, lead in the worship team as well. I didn't know what that looked like. And I also didn't know which path he wanted me to choose. Within... Ultimately, though, I did, I picked Kara City, as you guys can tell, Um, and within two months of being here at that time, I began to feel unworthy. I began to feel like I just wasn't good enough. I had self-doubt, and I had just all of this self-worthiness just build up inside me, and on top of that, I had just lost my brother to cancer two months into being here, and I just felt like I just need to pack up and go, I don't belong here. I I don't know what I'm doing here. I doubted God. I did. I didn't trust him. And I got to the point where I I started to have attitude changes, and it started to affect my relationships sometimes with people. And I finally just talked to Pastor Chris, and he kind of gave me just a slap on the head. And he was like, dude, you got to trust that God has you here and let all the other stuff go. You have to. Since being here at Care City now, I've gotten a lot of mentorship. I've gotten to build a lot of unique and amazing relationships. I've been under the mentorship of Chris and Nathan, and you guys have helped me out miraculously. It is so funny how much I have grown from you guys. Fast forward to just a couple months ago, I really see now why God's called me. I am, I've just been ordained. I am a youth pastor of some crazy, wacky kids. It is awesome, and I love you guys. (laughs) And and a lot, just, I got to share Brendan's story with a lot of people here. And I see now why God has me. I was doubting at first. I didn't want to give up the control of where I was going or what was going on. And I didn't know where to go. I thought I needed to know all the details. I thought I needed to know my path, what involved in that. I thought I needed to know. But that's not my job. Trusting in God is hard, and we doubt that plan sometimes, the plan he has for us. But it's not our job to doubt God's plan, but to go and trust that God provides. Today, we're kicking off a series called Wanderers, uh, and we'll be taking the next six weeks to look at the journey that the Israelites had from Egypt all the way to the promised land. And today, we'll be be starting uh, with the Israelites making their way to the Red Sea. We're going to be looking at the book of Exodus chapter 14. Before I get into this story, let me give you a refresher of what's happened up to this point. The Israelites had been enslaved for hundreds of years before this. And it wasn't always like this, though. Joseph, who brought the Israelites to Egypt, was in good standing with the Pharaoh. At first, they weren't slaves. But when the new Pharaoh took over during that transition, he turned the Israelites and made them into slaves. He was scared of them. After a few hundred years of the Israelites being slaves and afraid, they cried out to God, and God raises up a man named Moses, who intercedes and helps God deliver his people. Moses now coming into the kingdom of Egypt, and he says there will be punishments for Pharaoh not letting his people go. And this is where we get the ten plagues from. God begins to work behind the scenes using Moses and showing how powerful he was. And here are just some of the harsh plagues. You have the Nile River that turned completely to blood. You have the swarm of locusts that swarmed the entire kingdom of Egypt. And not only that, but I mean, it rained hail. In the middle of the desert, it rained hail. Hail. Like, come on. That's crazy. You, you try to walk outside right now and it didn't rain a three-inch wide ball of hail. Like that, you would not ever believe that. And then we have the final plague, which was the death of the firstborn son in any household that did not follow these specific instructions. Sacrificing of a spotless lamb, spreading the blood of that lamb above their doorstep. They have to eat all of the lamb 
and whatever they do not eat, they have to burn. Those instructions. Anyone who in that city that did not follow those lost their firstborn son that night. That included the Pharaoh. And after losing his son, he finally realized and released the Israelites, and they fled into the desert. And this is where we'll be picking up in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Hiroth in between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite of Baal Safan. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the, the, the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, but I will gain, gain glory for myself through the Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am Lord. In these four verses, Israel had just left Egypt, and they were almost to the end of the race. They almost got to the finish line. They almost made it to the sea. But God says, turn around, march back this way, and camp. And I'm sure the Israelites were like, um, God, we're, we just, we were here. We, we almost made it. Why? I mean, you just did a bunch of really cool stuff, so I guess I'll follow. But okay. Like, they were confused, right? And they wanted to know why. They wanted to know what was going on. And now God had a plan for Israel. They just didn't know it yet. And soon after, something happens. And the Israelites really start to doubt God. And we see that here in verses 5 through 12. Verse 5 says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over them. The Lord hardened the heart of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he will pursue the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Hiroth, opposite of Balsaphon. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to the desert to die? Was it because, what have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better to, for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So when the Israelites were approached by the Egyptian army, you would think, you would think they'd be jumping for joy because they had just seen what God did. They had just seen the miraculous powers of the ten plagues and him delivering them from the Egyptians but they didn't. Instead, they were ready, and they just tucked in a ball, crying, ready to die, ready to give up. They doubted. They were lost. Now, I guess I could understand a little why they were ready to give up. I mean, they just made, made up their minds, but they had been enslaved for 400 years. And the Pharaoh had the greatest military resources of all time. Chariots were the most sophisticated military technology. And there wasn't another army at that time that was going to beat them. Later in the story, in scripture, it also calls the Israels an army. But I wouldn't call them an army. They weren't Texas cornbread-fed beef boys. They weren't that. They were these skinny little slaves. They were only given enough food to survive and work. That was it. Even with all of that, they still saw what God did. They still saw the full power of the ten plagues. But they still questioned, why here? Why now? Why are we going to lose? And you know, it's really easy for us to think that we wouldn't doubt God in this moment. It's really easy for us to say, well, I wouldn't doubt God like that. But we all have had those moments where we doubt him, even though we have seen him, we have seen him do amazing things in our lives and other people's lives. So I want to ask you guys something. Why do we doubt? Why do we doubt God? You may not think you do. You may think that you have full faith in him. But I want you to think about your past and about your present. Do you tend about where you're going, where you're going and how you're gonna handle your circumstances, how you're gonna take care of your family? 
Maybe, what kind of, maybe you're the kind of person that's very controlling their future and you just want everything to happen how you have it planned and when it goes wrong, you freak out. You think everything's been lost because it didn't go your way. I know everyone in this room from time to time has had these moments. These may be some big moments that we deal with and that's when we tend to focus on the why me, the, the selfish mindset. How can I fix this? What can I do? We tend to distrust God in these big moments because it's not how we thought it would go, because it's not what we envisioned for ourselves. Look at the Israelites, though. They didn't trust in what was happening. They were all ready to go, completely excited about where they were going, and as soon as those circumstances changed, it flipped. They questioned They doubted. They said things like, Moses, why are we here? You should have just left us in Egypt rather than leaving us out here in the desert to die. It completely flipped for them. This is the common quality, though, that we as humans all have. We like control. So when there is no control, we get scared. We begin to doubt. About five years ago, my brother was diagnosed with a brain tumor that was, it was massive. It had already splintered through most of his brain and the doctors were amazed that he was even alive at this point. I was angry at God. I doubted full heavily because my brother was one of the most innocent people that I'd ever met in my life. He'd never done anything wrong and he's never done anything. And I was like, why does he deserve this? God, why can't you take him and heal him? Why can't you just take away the sickness? Why can't you just give it to someone else? Those were the thoughts that I had. I even had thoughts like, if I was God, I would have healed him. But I wasn't. I didn't trust God in this unknown situation because I didn't believe that he would fix this problem how I wanted him to. I didn't believe that he could because I was angry, and I know that wasn't right. I thought he would provide in a way that wouldn't be in my plan. Let me be honest with you, though. Doubting God is a sin, yes. God doesn't like it when we doubt because we're questioning him and his faithfulness. We're questioning him and his power, him and who he is. So why do we doubt? Why? Could it be because we're scared of the unknown? Yeah, sure but it's also because we don't have control in those situations, in those drastic situations that we can't control that. We may know some of what's going to happen in God's plan. We may know a little bit of that, but we don't know all. We want the plan to be how we are picturing life to be or how we want it to go because we're controlling in that, and we want our problems resolved our way. And when it doesn't go our way and we don't understand things and why things are happening, we get angry, we get scared, and we lose trust and doubt. But God's plan isn't something that we always get to see every detail of. It isn't a full picture, but rather a small piece of that picture. It says in Psalms chapter 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. God's word is his word. And if his word is a light for us to walk under, then who are we to steer from that? Who are we to change that path? And who are we to question that path? Let me show you what I'm talking about. If you guys could help me, let's turn off all of the lights in the room. I want it to be pitch black real fast. I want to show you guys what I'm talking about. This verse, you guys see this light? Right? It's a small light. But if I follow the light, I know that I'm protected in this area. And if I follow it here, I know because I can see here. And I can come over here, and I know that I can see here. But I can't see everything else around me. Now I want all of the lights to come back on. (laughs) I want you to take a look at this light. This light's big. It shows everything around you. You feel much safer in that light, right? You feel like you can see things, that you can see what it looks like, what the plan is. And that first slide I showed you, that's God's plan for us. We don't get to see everything. 
just like that verse said, is a path for us to stand and walk on. This is what God shows us where we go and what we can see. God's word is this light, his will, and it's where we will walk and follow that light. But that big light, that's what we want to see. That's what we want to picture. I want to be able to see all of what's had for me so that I know how to control this situation. We want this floodlight, but God generally gives us the flashlight. But we don't get to choose which light we get. God does. God shows us, and he shows us the times that we get to see it on his time. We can't change that, even though that we might want to. God is the one who gets to know all of this. He is the creator of all things, so of course he gets to know. I want to read you guys a scripture that comes from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are your thoughts. This is God's power, his sovereignty. And if you don't know what sovereignty means, it's meaning supreme power or authority. Now, if we believe who God is and who he says he is, then why do we question, try to control, and change that path for us? We don't get to do that. You don't have to know everything that God has in store for you, what his plans are for you, even though they're good. You don't have to know what they are, but they're still good. I mean, we wouldn't be able to comprehend all that God has in store for us. But we can still trust that his plans are good and better than ours, can't we? Yes, I know it's hard for us to trust in God in the unknown, but that's exactly what I'm challenging you guys to do. Is it still hard to rely fully on God and his power? So I want to challenge you guys. Live by the flashlight. Trust in God's sovereignty and his provision and let him guide you on your next steps. Let's look back at chapter 14 and verses 13 through 20. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you will see, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you only need be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Pharaoh and all of his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of the Israel's armies withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of the cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Through the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so that neither went to the other all night long. Moses is telling the Israelites not to be afraid, that they'll be delivered. But I think he said it more with a tone of, hey, stop doubting, you dummies. Look what I have done. Why do you keep doubting? The Israelites were protected They didn't need to worry about what was going to happen. They just needed to listen to Moses and to God. And when they see this cloud split and there's light and darkness and they can't see their armies, they start to begin to develop a little trust. They're like, okay, well, I see that now we're, we're a little protected. Yeah, sure. They saw that God was working. They started to trust God's plan a little bit and know that they shouldn't doubt. After all that, though, it wasn't a full trust. After the Israelites were given a wall of light, and they were able to walk towards the water now, they didn't want to. They still doubt it just a little bit. And it doesn't even stop here. Through the next six weeks, we see Israelite doubt time and time again on their journey to the promised land. They continue to doubt. So this is my challenge to you. Don't be like the Israelites. Don't doubt God, but pray, pray, And trust that he has you where you belong right now. You need to trust God when you doubt. And trust that he's moving, just like that pillar was moving for the Israelites. Trust he's moving behind the scenes. When you can't see him, trust that he is moving with you. Trust that he has you. God moves behind the scenes. And remember, we don't get the floodlights. We only get that flashlight. We only get to see what God shows us. Let's continue reading and finish up chapter 14 just to see how God will provide when we trust him. 
Verse 21 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, Let us get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting on their side. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hands over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The, the water flowed and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The day the Lord saved the Israelites, the Israel from the hands of Egyptians. And the Israel saw the Egyptians laying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and, his, and in Moses, his servant. At the very end, we, when God delivered his people from the Egyptians, they trusted in him and in Moses. The Israelites didn't need to know what was going to happen, but they were just supposed to follow. Israel would have liked to have known more of God's plan, but they didn't get to. They had to make the choice to follow God at the end. And as Christians, that goes for us. When it comes to the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why, we only need to focus on what we're called to. We don't need to focus on anything else. We don't have to know God's plan and what he has in store for us to trust him. We just need to trust and keep moving forward. So please don't miss what God has for you just because you're trying to find an, the explanation for what it is he has for you. Trust in him. Follow his word. And now maybe you aren't a slave that was trying to escape from the Egyptians. Maybe you know what it looks like to have lost your job. Maybe you know what it looks like to not be able to pay rent or to struggle with paying rent. Maybe you just filed the divorce papers or you have a loved one that is struggling and suffering from an illness. Every single one of us is going to be faced with these moments where we feel the odds are stacked against us. Like we won't know the outcome or even what to do. But here's what I want y'all to do in these moments. Trust in God, give up control, and follow. And here's some ways that you guys can do that. One of the ways that you could start giving up control is by praying. And there are two ways that, that you could pray during these times. First, Ask that God will work in your life. Ask him to help you because we can't go through these situations in life alone. Ask that he provides for you because he's our provider. But don't do it in a selfish manner. As in like, God, please do this for me. God, please do this for me. Do this for me. And I'm not saying that you can't ask for healing or that you can't ask for another job or maybe just where to go. Because you can ask for that but ask for it in a way knowing that it may not be the way you want it to be. Because God's will does not always follow our vision. And when you pray these ways, know that it may not happen the way you want it to happen. Yes, ask for these things, but also ask for God's will to be done in them. The second way that you can pray is just by praying thanks and praise to him. And, and in the Bible, it literally shows us how to do this. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. When you change your prayer from a selfish mindset to a prayer of thanksgiving, to a prayer of praise, you will begin to see a shift in perspective of your situation. And we see this in the, the verse immediately after six, where Paul goes on to say in verse seven, and the peace of God, will tran which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
after praying like this, watch what will happen in your life. Praying with gratitude changes your mindset. It changes your perspective. And even in moments of great stress or danger, God will give you that peace. It doesn't come from us controlling. It doesn't come from us trying to change the outcome or by getting the full picture. We will begin to feel peace that transcends all understanding, just like that verse says. That's what praying with thanksgiving and praise and with understanding will do for us. Throughout most of my brother's battle with cancer, I doubted God's plan. I knew I was wrong for that. So last year, when the time was coming, it was coming to a close, I started to ask God, God, I just, just, just your will to be done. God, I, I realized that you actually gave us more time, Father God, that you gave us three extra years with my brother than he was intended because the doctor said he was supposed to pass, but God gave us five in total from when he was diagnosed. And when we prayed as a family all around him that night, we prayed for God's will to be done and for healing, whether that was heavenly or earthly, it didn't matter. I just wanted God's will to be done. And then I was at peace with what had happened. I thanked God during this moment. I prayed and thanked him and praised him that I got that time with Brendan. And as I look back on that situation, when I doubted and I lost trust and I didn't believe he would do anything, God was there. He gave a story for us to tell people. He was giving us more time with Brendan. God was there behind the scenes and I doubted. And I see now, I see that now, that I should have just trusted God during that time than doubting. So during these times of struggle, during these situations of fear, when we feel like we're lost and that we can't beat this, I want to challenge you guys to trust. Pray that God's will will be done. Pray and thank him and praise him for what he has done and what he will do. So that's my challenge for you guys today trust God or will you doubt God let's pray